This is the birthday of one George, the General Washington. This date, 1732. He's uh, no longer alive, uh, by the way. Uh, our uh, co-host on the program, the New York Times best-selling author, John Yilstrap. Good morning, Johnny. Good morning. Also- imagine, imagine what, what George Washington must have looking back on his life and everything that he did and accomplished. Yes. What, what a fulfilling moment that must be to look back for him. He would have been looking back in 1799 as the last year on uh, on the earth. That would be the end of the life of George Washington. The father of our country. Also, Jefferson County Prosecuting Attorney Matt Harvey. Good morning, Matt Harvey. Good morning. You know, George Washington was a, a lover of Jefferson County and Berkeley County and Morgan County. Frequent visitor, mm-hmm. property owner. Yes. And relocated his family here. Aren't there more Washingtons buried in Charlestown than in any place else? Did I you think tell so. me that? Yeah. Yeah. There's a, I forget how many. It's a, at, at um, the church downtown. Is it? I don't know if it's Mount Zion, the Episcopal Church, or I'm going to butcher that. So somebody, will, somebody on Facebook will clean me up. But it's that uh, beautiful little church there. Mm-hmm. I can see it from my office, and uh, several Washington brother or family members are buried there. So rich and fertile ground in colonial and Civil War history. Absolutely, absolutely. Jefferson County. Speaking of which, uh, Mr. John Hardy, a child of the county. Good morning, John. How are you? Hey, good morning, gentlemen. Thanks for having me. A little fun fact. I uh, was uh, chosen to lay a wreath at the tomb of General Washington. He uh, was more uh, wanted to be called general than he wanted to be called president. Uh, my family had uh, visited Mount Vernon. They were doing a ceremony there, and uh, I was chosen to lay a wreath at his tomb, which was kind of cool. Very nice. Hey, uh, did you ever see the John Adams miniseries that was on, I think, about 10 years ago or so? Uh, HBO? Yeah, I did. I, I, yeah, I, I was, it, was a very, it was a very good uh, documentary, of, you know, talking about Adams' life and his yep. relationship with Jefferson and, and how important his wife was in his life. His wife, his wife was, um, uh, like my wife, a, a great sounding board. You know, she would kind of get him back in line if, she, you know, if he was kind of getting in over his skis, so... Very, very good documentary. I thought Paul Giamatti was horribly cast in that. I just thought he was a bad choice. I, I enjoyed the, the miniseries, but I just didn't. I didn't think he was the right guy. I respect your opinion, being as that you're in that business. But I'm a big Paul Giamatti fan, so I kind of, I kind of liked him. It was just rerun by HBO over the weekend, by the way. So I just uh, kind of watched a little bit of it again and recorded a bunch of it too. It's a lot easier just to record it than to try to get it on the, on demand but uh anyway i'll sit down and watch rewatch the uh the series again in total maybe over the weekend a little bit or whatever john let's uh let's talk money and uh also i think uh crossover day is what saturday sunday so yeah this is a very busy week uh in the house and also we're on the senate side this is the last week friday is the last day or saturday really but we're going to meet really late on into friday <coughs> excuse me uh this is a busy week all the bills must be out of their uh, house of origination and are out of their committee by Friday um, of the committee of origination. So, uh, yeah, this is a crunch week. A lot of bills are dying this week. I've, I have long lines in my office every day with people giving me bill numbers and please check on my bill. Where is it at? It's a good bill. Everybody has a good bill. Every, you know, everybody builds a good bill and everybody's bill it doesn't cost any money or it doesn't cost much money. So, I've been, uh, I have a, a, a piece of paper that I carry around with me that I have bill numbers on them, and I have a numbering scale that I use where the bills are and if they're dead, if they have any type of life, if they're going to run. Um, you know, so uh, it's, it's, it's a really busy week. The uh, we got a lot of things to cover today, and we've got uh, a, a show full of delegates, uh, in fact, uh, Coming up here, too, uh, Mike Hornby will join us, uh, also Doug Smith, because Teacher Carey passed uh, the House yesterday uh, as well. So uh, we're going to get to some of that stuff later on this morning. I want to talk to you about Social Security and the state's income tax on Social Security and the likelihood that that goes away this year by the conclusion of this legislative session, John. Yeah, so I'm quite certain that well, that legislation will finish the House today uh, as on reading, and that will completely eliminate all um, tax 
on Social Security in the state of West Virginia. We had had a program where it was $50,000 on an individual and $100,000 for a married couple. But uh, we are going to join 40 other states uh, that have already enacted that legislation to completely remove all tax on Social Security income at the state level. Uh, we opted to do a three-year phase-in instead of taking the whole $37 million hit at one time. Uh, we opted to do a three-year phase-in. Um, we, we, we have, in the House Finance Committee, we have adopted the policy of trying to do incremental politics and trying to use phase-ins um, as a fiscally prudent and a fiscally responsible way of being able to reduce our coffers by still trying to cut taxes on taxpayers. So what's that going to do, John? Phase up the income threshold until it completely gets rid of it? Um, it's a, it's a three-part phase, so it's a percentage, percentage, percentage. So it, it really, it's really, it's just a, a, per, a percentage on the first so the tax rate will be, I mean, on the first percentage or the first year, it'll be the percentage, and then it, it, and it grows as it goes. Now, I, I've had conversation with Mark Muko, who is kind of our economist down here. Uh, I think he's the Deputy Revenue Secretary. And he was trying to explain to me how it was going to fit in. And I will tell you, it's very complicated, but I will tell you it was kind of backloaded. So the first year, the state coffers will not take as big of a hit second year it's a little bit bigger and then it's kind of backloaded on the on the back side of it I, I will tell you it's a very complicated impl- implementation of that system and it was explained to me in detail but i will tell you it's, it's a real hard concept to get a hold of now we get john hardy our guest he is the vice chair of finance go ahead mr gilstrap good morning john uh, hey, good morning <clears throat> all of these re- the uh, revenue cuts would be tax cuts um in a lot of cases it all it all inures to my benefit certainly if we're going to be talking about social security and what have you um and i don't i don't have a school age kid i don't have you know any of that. so all of these feel really good to me in terms of me getting to, to keep more money in my pocket but then when we look at all of the challenges that lie ahead for us in terms of uh fixing our infrastructure and the education system and what have you who is who balances the the uh, fiscal needs 10 years from now projected out with all of the cuts that we're doing right now are we presuming kind of a trickle down thing is going to going to happen that as we as we cut taxes we get more businesses and then those business taxes are going to fuel the economic engine or is it a math problem that's more precise than that i think it's a math problem that's completely always in flux and you're and you're constantly working to adjust to meet the needs um you know, I will tell you that the state's economy grows at about 140 to $150 million naturally every year if we do nothing, just the natural growth of the state. So by cutting that Social Security tax over a three-year period, you're never really going to go over 10% of that natural growth. So that's what really kind of made us feel comfortable about doing it that way. Uh, we have seen, you know, we've, we've cut our personal uh, property, our personal income taxes, uh, by uh, uh, quite a substantial amount of not ready to maybe hit another trigger to do another cut in those. I don't know if that trigger is going to be um, the full 10%, but there's at least going to be probably some trigger hit where there will be some percentage of cut in the uh, personal income tax. Uh, we have um, have a quite a convoluted system to uh, get your money back on your personal property taxes, and I'm hoping that somewhere in the near future – we can pass a constitutional amendment to streamline that somewhat easier for our taxpayers. But, so, you know, we have uh, of, uh, celebrated a lot of new growth in the state. We have a lot of new businesses that are coming online, and we're going to start seeing the, um, the benefit of these new businesses and the tax base and the employees that they are bringing online, and we're just hoping that the natural growth of the state continues uh, I feel like that you know the state of West Virginia has a big giant sign on it, you know, open for business, and, and we are bringing some very good companies to our state that are have paid uh, very well for the jobs that they provide, and is, is providing a, a a good tax base not only for our state government but for our local government, 
And that money goes back into our school systems and goes back into our infrastructure and right back into our local uh, fire EMS. And uh, so those are all good things. I think as the state continues to grow, uh, I think the, the policies that have been put in place in the last, you know, eight to ten years have really made the state an attractive place to want to locate your business. And, I, and I, we are hopeful that that track continues. But as, as I said earlier, it is a math problem that is always in flux and will always need to be tweaked and will need to be watched. And specifically on the income tax cut, uh, the triggers for the income tax cut, those are organic, right? They happen automatically if if they're met. That doesn't require additional action by the legislature. Am I right? Right. Those, those are set in statute. So those, those triggers are set in statute. So um, we don't have to address that every legislative session. Those triggers are set in statute, and then there's a certain formula of what number the trigger hits as to how much percent of the tax cut will be. It will, it will be no greater than 10%, uh, but it could be less than 10%. We could do a 3%, a 5%. It's really in, in all how the numbers come in. And I will tell you, I think it, that this being the first year, it's been a very cautious year here this year. It's been a very, not a lot of legislation, not a lot of money spent. Um, you know, we, we have a few things we're going to spend some money on with the Social Security tax cut. I believe that the, the, the public employee pay raise is going to happen. Um, you know, so but it's been a very cautionary year. I think with this being the first year that the tax cuts are set in statute, and we're kind of working about four or five months behind the curve because we don't really know where we're going to end up. So I think we're going to be we're going to be very cautious this year. And then we'll know more where we're at at about the end of July or August. And then you'll probably start seeing supplemental appropriation spending, um, going back out and giving money to agencies and things that we feel need money once we get a little more comfortable understanding where we're at at the end of the tax year. Matt Harvey. Good morning, Delegate Hardy. Good morning, Matt. Did you have a nice big cold glass of milk this morning before you come in? <laughs> <laughs> Good memory. Well played. Absolutely raw not. milk. Yes. Raw milk. If, well, yeah. if I oh, want to drink milk, it, it will be raw. Hey, hey guys, Warby's got some wins down here this year, man. He, I mean, he's impressing me. I, you know, I talk to him every day. He sits right behind me, and and uh, man, I, I mean, I'm thoroughly impressed. I mean, he's got some, he's got some wins down here this year. He's he's really having a good year. I'm proud of him. Hey, Warby's a people person. Uh, he's going to be on at nine o'clock this morning. By the way. And he's a persuasive he, person. He he got me to yeah. work here, right? Right. Well, he pays sure. you, and I can't imagine. I can't imagine what that's like. But yeah, he he has a great personality for this. Uh, he's a uh, he, you know he he's a people person. He likes to be in the mix, and uh, so he's uh, he's he's doing well. And I'm I'm very very proud of him. I don't know if that means anything, but I'm proud of him. I think he's working really hard. Yeah, he is, man. Good so, uh, Delegate Hardy, um, crossover day looming. Uh, generally creates a sense of urgency, I would imagine, amongst uh, delegates and senators. In particular, since this is your last session, do you feel any heightened urgency to get a particular issue addressed with legislation? Yeah, you know, my, my, I came down with about six or seven things that I really wanted to try to accomplish. And, and one of the things was taken by the governor, it became a governor's bill, and so I feel pretty confident that that legislation will get finished, and that's the expansion of the, the homestead and the uh, real property tax for our seniors, and uh, there's a pretty convoluted formula in there, but we basically are just kind of relieving the, um, uh, lowering the standard for people to be able to access that, uh, and hope, hopefully trying to help more of our seniors in growth areas. I think that legislation is going to get finished as the governor's bill. That was, that was important to me. Um, the SRO bill is very important to me, and I, unfortunately, I do not think that that's going to complete uh, the legislative process this year. Um, it's a financial ask of about $28 million, which I, I think uh, if you break that down, what that costs per student, we're looking at about $114.24 and per student to protect your child you know, for the entire year. And we can't guarantee that they're 100% safe, but I can guarantee that they're safer than they are. They would be safer under this scenario than they are today. Uh, the $28 million is, is just the uh, – and that's a base building. And I was hopeful that we could pull that money out of drawdown for, um, you know, the uh, 
falling enrollment. Uh, but it's been made pretty clear to me that a lot of that money is being used for pay raises, and it's being used for other things. Uh, I wanted to try to take that out of the purview of the State Board of Education and really put that into other agencies' hands uh, because I felt like it would be managed better. Uh, I think that caused some problems with it. I think um, if if there was a second bite at the apple, maybe we would try to make that a, another step in the school aid formula. Um, it's a very convoluted process, uh, but I'm very concerned. You know, I'm really uh, – this is something that we really need to be proactive on and not reactive on. I think you guys are having Doug Smith on later. Uh, he was able to pass a, a teacher carry bill yesterday. Uh, I voted in support of that bill. I think anything that we can do at this point to keep our children safer, uh, we, we should do. Uh, I do like the thought of having trained law enforcement officers in our schools. Uh, I do um, like the provisos that was in the bill for a, a considerable amount of training uh, for the volunteer program for um, Delegate Smith's program or his bill. But, uh, you know, there's, and there's a such urgency from all delegates right now because if your bills aren't on the agenda by Friday, they're dead. Matt, any more? Yeah, locality pay has always been an issue that I, that's been front of mind for you and other delegates up here in the Eastern Panhandle. Any progress on that this year? You know, I was very disappointed in the governor's speech this year. I was led to believe that there was going to be um, some some movement by the governor for locality pay this year, and the governor really just kind of started that. And I think I understand why. I mean, the governor and his staff, you know, they believe he has a substantial lead in his Senate race, and I think it was a very vanilla year for the governor. And it's been a very vanilla year down here anyway. I mean, all of our constitutional officers are uh, are, are moving around, so there hasn't been a lot of legislation come from them. And there's some tight Senate races, and there's some tight House races, and I think it was a really not to rock the boat type of year. So, But I have not heard a lot about locality pay. I think you're going to see that work more. In, in statute and bills that are passed that are going to give language, directive language as we pass in the um, CPS bill and also for the jail bill that we passed. Uh, I think you're, you're going to start seeing that more in that directive language for that uh, legislation that's passed. Yeah, we hear a lot about, you know, it, we're down to crunch time. We have all these bills that are either going to live or die, and they go, some of them are controversial, some of them are big, some of them are little. Then, how confident are you, or is the legislature, that the governor is going to sign all of these? I mean, are there is there another fight coming for some of these to with with the governor's office to have him not veto them? No, I don't think so. I mean, typically we will find out, you know, in the process in the committee process um, through the governor's staff which bills the governor has heartburn about and why he has heartburn about those. So some of those don't make it on the agenda. I'm not saying the governor controls the agenda, but it's a it's it's a you know it's a constant work in progress between the House, the Senate, and the governor's office, and there's give and take everywhere. And sometimes we know early on the governor's office uh, is not real real happy about a piece of legislation, and you know if we can uh, you know work that out before it goes all the way through this um, you know, final legislation, that will be done. And and, and the governor, you know, he typically only uh, vetoes a very small percentage of bills that finish. Um, both sides of the chamber, so it, it's, it's a very small um, percentage of those bills that actually get vetoed. So it's a, you know it, everything everything is a work in progress down here between all between both um, chambers of the of the um, the House and the Senate, and also working with the executive branch. Does he have a deadline by which to sign these bills before they just essentially become a pocket veto? No, he, he he has to veto them. If he refuses to sign them, they automatically become law. Okay. So we our system our system works with that the governor has a certain amount of time to either sign a bill or veto the bill. And then if he refuses to sign the bill, uh, there's a certain time period. And I'm sorry, I don't know that time period where the bill just becomes law. And there's there's been times where the governor has just said, "I'm not going to sign that piece of legislation." Because he doesn't want to collect, he's endorsing it, but he's not going to veto it either. So it just lays over and becomes law. Delegate John Hardy, our guest on the program here today. Uh, John is the vice chair of finance. John, you'll be out 
uh, after uh, this session. This will be your last year as a as a delegate. And in I think uh, the most recent year, we saw projections from the governor's office about uh, surpluses continuing for a couple of years at uh, at a billion plus. Uh, even with the tax cuts uh, kicking in, it would still, as as they further reduced, stay in the hundreds of millions of dollars. Then I saw another one that said in a couple of years, the state could be in trouble. They could be running uh, up against uh, uh, deficits uh, because of PEIA and, and other such obligations. Uh, as you get ready to leave this state financially, are you confident that the state will be in good hands a couple of years down the line? with continued tax cuts that are being passed? Yes. Uh, yes. I mean, I, I am very confident that the state is in good shape. I, I uh, you know, there's going to be a lot of change coming to the legislature. The governor's office is going to change. There will be, I'm sure there will be secretary positions that change, and there could be policy change. You never know what direction a new governor may take the state in. Uh, there's a lot of uh, institutional knowledge that's leaving the house and, and uh, so you know, there, there's everything's constantly in flux. But from what I can see and what I what I can tell, I feel like that the state is in good financial shape uh, for the next project three to four years. Um, it's really hard to project. The further you get out, the less confidence you have in those projections. But as I said, talking about Mark Muko, uh, who is our deputy revenue secretary, um, you know he, he Mark is a is a financial genius. He's he's kind of one of those guys. He probably had a little trouble buying his shoes. But uh, when it comes to economy and forecasting and looking at the history, and, and the history typically repeats itself in these financial markets, uh, you know, Mark has a lot of confidence in what we're doing and, and the way that we're moving forward. I have confidence in the way that the state is moving forward. Um, you know, um, barring there being some type of economic collapse from the, you know, in the United States, uh, you know, a major recession or – or God forbid, you know, something major happens in the country. I think that we are poised to be in good shape. Our growth to be continue um, in other parts of the state. We see the growth in our area. I uh, think that Berkeley County is positioning itself to to um, you know to continue to grow. Uh, hopefully, we can figure out some ways to put some checks and balances on some of our um, home, some of our residential growth. Um, but, you know, I, I feel very confident in the way the state's moving forward and other parts of the state are starting to grow and reap those uh, economic benefits that we have uh, put in place. John, uh, as a final thought, if you could give me your uh, I know you voted for it because it passed 89-11 on a partisan uh, vote. The teacher carry bill. We're going to get into this in great depth with Doug Smith, the sponsor of the bill, Art Tom from the NRA later on in the uh, show today. But uh, you're a leader in the House. What's your thought? Yeah, I voted in favor of the bill. It wasn't something that I was always a real big proponent of, but I've kind of come around on it. I think that there is uh, uh, a lot of detail in the training uh, that must be completed before a teacher will carry a firearm. It's a complete volunteer program. A, a, a teacher or a, a school personnel, you know, someone in the school has to volunteer to do it. Um, I think that anything that we can do to make our students safer, uh, you know, when something like that happens and there's no one there to protect someone and you need that coverage for the five to seven minutes for law enforcement to get on scene, and hopefully when law enforcement gets on scene that they will do what they need to do, um, it gives you a little sense of security. So anything that we can do at this point in time to make our students safer, uh, I think it's a, it's a great thing. Uh, and, and, I, and I preface that with saying, but I think it all at some point in time it, it, it should be our uh, objective to get trained law enforcement officers in our schools to protect our students not only from outside threats but inside threats and also being able to work to try to head off um, problems before they can fester and, and, and become larger than they need to be. John, I appreciate your time this morning. Have a good day, sir. Thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity. Delegate John Hardy, Vice Chair of Finance at uh, 830.